Amen. Thank you, Mrs. Green. Tremendous message in that song. I hope, I hope that you're not ashamed to say the name and share the name of Jesus after all he's done for us. John chapter 17, if you have your Bibles, please, this morning. John, the 17th chapter. As we look at our theme for this year, look at God's Word. We live in a fast-paced, ever-evolving, breakneck-speed world. I was reminded of that this morning come the way to church when I got stuck behind a slow driver. <laughs> 35 in a 35. Who would do that? But Miss Trogan plays the piano so well, I hate to even say anything negative about her. I wouldn't even want to draw attention to her this morning. I wouldn't. So leave it at, I got behind the slow driver for a moment. We live in a fast-paced world, though, don't we? They say if you turn on uh, the television, the screen now will change. I think it's every three seconds, every four seconds now, somewhere in there, rapidly changing. Our attention span is less and less and less. In fact, they say that you really can't have church like you used to because people just won't stick around for it any longer. I was reading an article about uh, the new church trends. I try to not stay current, but see what, what are people saying, you know, other pastors, other religious leaders, not necessarily from our stripe, but just in general, what are they saying? And one thing they said was this, they said this year, pastors are going to focus more on content, less on reps. It was an interesting little phrase, I thought, well, what does that mean? And according to the survey they did, they asked uh, pastors at churches how often they preached at their church, how many times a year they preached in their church. And the average number of times that a pastor preached in his pulpit was 33 to 39 times a year. All right, with services only on a Sunday morning, you'd have 52, and even then they're only preaching a portion of those times. They made the, the comment inside the article, they said it used to be that a pastor would prepare three times a week, but that trend is leaving. We live in a fast-paced, breakneck-speed, ever-evolving world. Things that we wouldn't dream of thinking about happening five years ago are now a reality. Institutions that we thought were sacred are no longer that way in society. We live in a fast-paced, ever-evolving, breakneck speed world. We are bombarded and sometimes bewildered by what goes on around us. I don't know about you, but there's times that you, you see perhaps an article or you see a particular uh, thing, a thought process, and you can't do anything else but shake your head. W what are we thinking? Are we even thinking? We are sometimes bewildered, but often bombarded. We as Christians are moving, but unfortunately not always meditating. We move along inside of Christian things, right? We get, come on Sunday morning and many Sunday night and Wednesday night, and we look the part, we bring our Bible the part, we nod our head at the right time. We're moving, but seldom meditating. Is this what life was supposed to be like, to rush from point A to point B, to come into church and come out of church and wait till the next church, and in between there, whatever, whatever happens, happens. I would challenge us this year to refocus our thoughts, to realign our minds, our passions, and our souls on one thing, and that is only God. John chapter 17, verse 3, Jesus says these words, and this is life eternal. This is life eternal. The reality, the fact is that life eternal is true life. Anything else is a cheap substitute. And Jesus says, and this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. It was this summer when I was in my devotion time with the Lord and came across this particular passage. I was thinking, not necessarily thinking about the theme for this year, but just in general, I, as I read the Bible, think and meditate on what God is showing and teaching me, and came across this particular passage. And this verse right here struck me in a new and different way, and I'll bring some of those messages in the next few weeks about only God. I am struck by the fact that Jesus says, 
that life eternal is to know the only true God because we are surrounded by so many false gods. Chiefly among them is touted the God named me. You are strong enough. I am strong enough. I am capable. I should use my thoughts. And we see it every single day in this world because the only way we can accomplish something is if we take our collective wisdom, our collective study, our collective science, and thereby find a solution, ascertain a path that is correct. And in a sense, again, the call comes out, you are a God to yourself. There is nothing greater than you in the universe. And Jesus says, the only way to know true life is to know the, the only true God. This year I'm asking that we renew our intensity, our focus, our passion, our desire, our souls on one thing, and that is God. Lord, I ask you to help us this morning. Lord, a serious topic, a serious, a heavy concept, you. Lord, may our hearts be challenged. May our souls be pricked by your Holy Spirit. Lord, may we, in a new light, in a new way, be shown things that perhaps we have shunned, turned aside, or even yet rejected. Lord, would your spirit touch us this morning, move us and change us. Lord, we only need you. But may it be true in our hearts and our souls that the only thing we want is you. Lord, I love you. I thank you for this time. Help us this morning. Lord, I ask if there's someone here or online who doesn't know you as their Savior, the only true God, Lord, I'd ask that this morning their hearts would be opened by your spirit. They'd respond to you in salvation in Jesus' name. Amen. We are bombarded, we are asked, implored to always add just a little bit more to our life. That's the purpose of advertisements, commercials, written and, and otherwise. Add another credit card to your mass of credit cards. Add another bill, just a little bill, just a few dollars a month. Just add one more thing. Add another vehicle. Add another house. Add to your wealth. You can add to your 401k. We are asked to add just one more thing. We're asked, we're challenged to add to our knowledge, to add to our toys. In America, we are surrounded by abundance. We have more money than the rest of the world, on average. We have more clothes than most of the world does, and that's just in one closet, it seems. And shoes, don't get me started on shoes. Because I could tease my wife, but she'll tell you I may be guilty as well of shoes. Add one more thing. Toys, trucks, vehicles, purses, money knowledge just add a little bit more and we're also challenged to keep on moving on in life I was in the store on New Year's Eve why only because I had no other choice holiday shopping is not my favorite shopping in general is not my favorite but holiday shopping for sure but imagine my surprise one limited surprise when I'm walking down the aisle and I was in the Kroger in Frankenmuth and there in the card aisle was a display on New Year's Day for Valentine's Day as if I needed help remembering it. I'm married, of course I remember Valentine's Day. Anniversary, sweetest day, my wife's birthday, I know all of them. When do they happen? Every day. <laughs> she has me. What more does she need? <laughs> Don't ask her that question. <laughs> You've seen this though. I was talking to Pastor Scott, he said he saw Easter candy already placed out for display. Isn't that the world we live in though, is it not? You finish one thing and like, oh my goodness, it, the Christmas decorations are up already, and it's February. We're challenged to move on what is, to what is next, but I'm challenging us this year 
for life to be simple and singular, only God. What would life look like? What would your life look like? What would my life look like if all I did was to be concerned about what God wanted from me today? What would my life look like? What if all I spent my money on was what God told me to spend it on? What if all of my thoughts were centered on pleasing God all day in 2021? Imagine, if you would, for a moment, that you went to a hotel. And you planned on spending just a few nights there. You get to the hotel, and as you get there, you realize that you know, the bed is soft. It's not as soft as you like. And so you go out to the store, and you go to the mattress store, and you buy a new $2,000 mattress for your motel. You bring it back, and the staff there, what are you doing, sir? Well, I need to put a mattress here. Can't sleep as well. Well, sir, this is a hotel. And sir, what's that art van truck? Well, I didn't like the couch that was in my room, so I, I bought a new couch for my room as well. And I didn't like the art on the wall. The art, it, it was so, so old-fashioned. I bought some new art, and I didn't like the plants, so I bought some new plants. And to be honest, the, the carpet guy's coming in an hour. He's going to re-carpet my room in the hotel. You'd be looked upon and scoffed and mocked and probably stopped from going inside the hotel any further. But is that not what we're guilty of at times? In this old world, we're just passing through. This old house is just a temporary dwelling, is it not? Yet it seems like we spend all our time, all our efforts, all our money on the temporary rather than only God. End of the Civil War. The Confederate money was worthless, effectively. Imagine that you knew that end was coming and you had a million dollars of Confederate currency. What would you do? Money's now worthless. But imagine you leave this life with a U.S. dollar and imagine you have a billion of them. My friend, it's worthless. Only one life, it'll soon be passed. Only what is done for Christ will last. In 2021, I will worship only God. I will seek only God. I will live for only God. I'm asking us this year to commit again, to refocus on only God. And this is life eternal. To shed some of the burdens that have weighed us down. Some of the mindsets that have hindered us. Some of the responsibilities that we have added onto our lives, which have been an obstruction to us, to worshiping the only and serving the only true God. You see, you find these verses throughout Scripture. Jesus in Luke chapter 2 says this to Satan, Get me behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. In Psalm chapter 62, verse 5, the, the psalmist writes, My soul, wait thou only upon God, for my expectation, my hope, is from Him. In Isaiah chapter 37, the scripture says, Now therefore, O Lord our God, save us from His hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that Thou art the Lord, even Thou only. Jesus, in Mark chapter 2, says, who can forgive sins but God only? You see, I desire a renewed commitment and focus on making God singular in our lives. 2020 was not a make it or break it year for Christians. 2020 was not a make it or break it year for Christians. In fact, as you read your Bible, when turmoil and calamity and trials come, it is not make it or break it for Christians. Those things are merely revealers of what's right here. 2020 did not make any Christians better or stronger or weaker. 2020 merely revealed the true faith or lack of true faith that was right here in our hearts. You see, outside circumstances cannot dictate inward reflection and inward worship. They merely reveal what is right here. 2020 was not make it or break it, it was a revealer. Our God must be singular. This morning I want to give you this first thought. He must be singular 
in position in your life. Now, I don't know about you, but in the Bible, I've read it through now a few times. I don't know everything in the Bible. I think you could study your whole life and not know everything. There are hidden mysteries there. I've tried to be a student of the Word of God, and I hope that never changes in my life. But there's this little phrase that I've said before, and I'll say it this morning. My problem, and I dare say your problem, is not usually a knowing problem or a knowledge problem. It's usually a doing problem. It's not that I don't know what I'm supposed to do. It's not that I don't know what God's truth is. It's that sometimes I get off track. How about you? Sometimes I make a choice that's not proper, and the Word of God brings me back to the position I'm supposed to be in. And this morning, I want to challenge us again to make sure that if we claim only God, that He is the only one in the top position in my life. That He's on top. That He's in control. That He's in charge. Not that we say He's in control. That's what we're supposed to say. Uh, who do you follow? Of course I follow God, right? Of course. I, I'm, I'm seeking his face for all my decisions. Well, did you ask him about this? Oops. Or did you look for him over here? Well, it was uh, singular in position. We claim that he is supposed to be the top person, that he is, have the preeminence, but is he? I'll give you three reasons this morning from the scriptures why he ought to be singular in position. That's what Jesus says, they might know thee, the only true God. He's supposed to be singular in position, first of all, because he is the maker. Would you turn here to Genesis chapter 1 in verse 1? Familiar verse, but I want you to look at it with me. As we open up our Bible, you have to go no further than the first four words to be introduced to God. No further than the first page and you're introduced to the maker of the universe. And all that we see, all that we are in awe of as we go and travel and see the natural wonders of the world. The Bible says in Genesis 1, would you look there with me? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Would you read that with me, please? Read that with me, please. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. You see, God enters, enters from the Bible as the supreme author of life. From the very first words that are mentioned in our scripture, he is introduced as the one who is in charge because he made everything. He has to be singular in position because he made it all. He is the maker. And you say, well, pastor, of course, I learned that in Sunday school when I was small. There are only two reactions that one can have when being introduced and challenged with this fact. It is either to recognize it or reject it. Either God made it or he didn't make it. There are no third options. Either God is in charge as a supreme author, as the one who began everything. And the Bible is filled with these phrases, author and finisher, alpha and omega. All right, beginning and ending. And either we can recognize it or we can reject it. We can recognize that God spoke it, that God made it, that God knows best. I began to read my Bible through again this year, and I've been underlining in Genesis, the book of Genesis, all the times that the Bible says this, and God said, and God said, maybe you get a moment one time, not right now, and go through there and find him in Genesis 1, Genesis 2, Genesis 3, Genesis 4, Genesis 5, repeatedly, and God said, and God said to him, and God said to Abraham, and God said to Noah, and God said to Jacob, and God said to Isaac. And God said to Adam, and God said to Eve, and God said to himself, let us make man in our image. God was speaking all over the place. God is always speaking. I followed up with the responses to what God said. I love Genesis chapter 1 because this is, in essence, to, to capture Genesis 1. God said it, it happens. Is that not true for all of Scripture? God said it, it happens. 
it may not be as quick as Genesis 1, but it is just as true. God said it. And then I see Abraham. God said it, and he did it. What a good reaction to have, is it not? If God says it, I'll do it. <laughs> and then because of that, the Bible says God blessed him. For listening to the supreme author, the one who knows everything, it, on a logical level, it would just be a good thing to do, to listen to the one who knows everything. All right, uh, Brother Trimble can fix cars. I'm not a mechanic. But if he said, hey, Brother Howell, do this, I would listen to him because he knows more than me about vehicles. I would be foolish to say, well, who are you to think you know about my vehicle? All right, I saw it on YouTube. I can do this. Or, or better yet, here, I got me a hammer, all right, and a crowbar. I'm going to fix my engine. What else do you need? Yet every single day, the reaction of so many people is not to recognize and put him single in a position. It's to reject. But why would I listen to him? And, and the amazing thing, God says, you listen to me. It's not only good for you. If I can, it's not only good advice. All right? And I don't, I'm not trying to blaspheme the God, but it, not only, it will work because he's right. But then he blesses people on top of it. So if you do what works and follow him, then he says, I I'll bless you. I was reading Joseph this morning. God caused him to prosper so much so that every single person saw it. With the supreme maker, we can recognize you're rejected. But understand, this same verse brings a rejection. Every single day, the world rejects God as the maker. From the very first verse of the Bible, they say, no. In the beginning, God created. I think I'll take a hard pass on that. It's not him, because if it's him, then the rest is true. They like to re reject his rules, and they mock those. They re reject his actions, and they question those. They reject his goodness, and they disregard it. And they begin to set themselves up as their own supreme ruler in their life. But my friend, Christian, we, if we're not careful, can do the same thing but I'm going to church and I'll keep God in that little compartment right there and I'll use him when I need him but he won't be the supreme being and supreme position in my life and while we would not, we would not think to reject him as creator we reject him as a singular God in our life I read a story about some parents who watched their, their young son playing baseball by himself in the backyard the story goes, they were watching him play baseball, and the young man tossed the ball to himself in a big swing and a miss, and he yelled to himself, strike one. Because he was umpire, gave himself a strike. But not to be deterred, he yelled, but I'm the greatest hitter in the world, and he tossed the ball up in the air, another big swing, and another big miss, strike two. They watched their young son Again, they called to himself, but I'm still the greatest hitter in the world. Tossed the ball up, and with a mammoth, life-altering swing, it seems, swung, and another miss. Strike three, I'm out. These parents wondered what their response of their child would be as the world's greatest hitter was just struck out. But not to be deterred, the young man said this, well, look at that. I must be the world's greatest pitcher for striking out the world's greatest hitter. <laughs> Is that not what we do? That wasn't a miss. I'm still amazing. I can still recover from this. Only God, Revelation chapter 4, verse 11 says this, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. There's a response that we're supposed to have to, to, to knowing that God is the maker. The two-facet uh, two response, submission and to glorify. You see, if God is the maker, then I ought to follow Him. If God is the, the maker, then what he says is going to be good for my life because he's the boss. 
If God is the maker and the supreme ruler in my life, then I will submit to what he says I'm supposed to do. And my friend, this morning, as you begin 2021 in church on a Sunday, January the 3rd, can you say before the Lord, he is my only God, and also that I submit to him in my life. It is two different attitudes to claim him as God and to submit to him. And Christians, we can be good at submitting to everything else. Listen to our financial advisor. Listen to the internet. Listen to those around us. And fail to listen to the author of life. Submission. Can you say, Pastor, only God has a direct line right here. When God whispers, I listen. When God speaks, I follow. When God moves, I move. Only God in my life. When God mentions, I take note. What God likes, I like. What God hates, I hate. The things that God desires, I have tried to make my desires. And the things that God rejects, I've done my best to reject in my life. See, 2020 didn't make it or break it for Christians. It just revealed who was on top. Not only should we submit to him, we're supposed to glorify him. That's what Revelation says. For his glory and his pleasure were all things created. Or we can say it this way. My job as a Christian, as a follower of God, is to make God famous. How are you doing at making God famous? To make him to be known. There are clothes that people will wear because they like the brand. Now sometimes it's because a brand is known to be good quality and it's maybe money that is well spent. Other times it's because they want everyone else to know that they're wearing a certain brand. There are cars that people drive. Sometimes... It's because it's a good brand. Money well invested, if you can actually invest money in a car. Other times, it's so that other people know, this is the car I drive. There are things that we do that do not glorify the Lord. But we make other things famous. We make our hobbies famous to other people. We make the food we eat famous to other people. We make the sports that we like famous to other people. But do we make God famous to those around us? Or what have you done to be about his business? There's a young boy, just 12 years old. He got left in the temple. Ah, he stayed in the temple. His parents went a day's journey and could not find the boy named Jesus. Uh Uh-oh, we thought he was somewhere else in the caravan. We better go back. And they got back, and they did not find Jesus for three days. For three days, he was in the temple. Now, what a striking thought that that this young man at 12 years old was not out roughhousing with the others, was not out chasing the young, cute girls. He was on a mission of eternal value, of a calling of the utmost significance. He did not even stop to alert his earthly parents. He was just in the temple with the scribes and the lawyers and the Pharisees talking about God in such a way that the Bible says they wondered, they were amazed at his depth. Has anyone ever been amazed at the depth of your spirituality? They came as only parents can come, right? And with worry, no doubt Mary, as a mother, was worried sick about her son, like any good mother would have been, right? Joseph, perhaps, maybe not so much, who knows? If it's like a typical family, the father's like, I'm sure he's fine, Mary. You know, he's somewhere else. And Mary, I told you he wasn't in the caravan. I'm just adding to what the scripture says, of course. When they 
confronted him, Jesus said to them, How is it that ye sought me? Wished ye not, did you not know that I must be about my Father's business? And my friend, what a great phrase for 2021 for Christians. You sought me at work. I was there, but didn't you know I was about my Father's business? Did you just see? I was, I was not doing my own things. It was not my own plans. I wasn't just hanging out with the other boys that I found. I was about my Father's business. I wonder this year, are you and I seeking to make God famous? He's only God. He's a supreme maker. And our reaction, our response ought to be to glorify and submit in glorification to make Him famous. Am I seeking to make Him famous or am I just making myself famous? Am I about his business or am I just about my business and my problems and my responsibilities? Do people just know me or do they know him? About my father's business. Well, my friend, have you ever been distracted from your responsibilities here because of opportunities there? Jesus as a son, as a brother, was distanced and distracted from those responsibilities because of a greater calling in his life. 2021, I'm asking us to focus only God. A renewed focus. I'm not asking you if you're perfect or not. I'm just asking, is he on top? And I'm not asking for a phrase. I'm asking for a response. A phrase says, well, of course, Pastor. I'll post it on my Facebook feed, and and I hope you do. But does your life show? Does your heart show? Does your soul breathe only God? Or have you become distracted, distanced, bewildered, moved by all the trinkets? By all the trinkets. You see, when God's not your focus, when God's not all there is, everything else has a lot of sparkle to it. Fireworks would be really amazing if I'd never seen lightning. Only God. Lord, I thank you for loving us. Lord, I pray and ask you'd help us to be honest this morning. Lord, we desire to follow you. There are many things that pull and want to weigh laced to our souls. Lord, I'd ask you'd help us to search our hearts this morning. Wonder, my friend, this morning, if God touched your heart. Maybe you've been saved for a long time. Maybe you've claimed the name of Jesus for many years. Maybe you've been distanced. Not because of God, because of you. I'm asking this year, that's only God, that we renew a commitment, a focus, a mindset, desire, a passion on Him. And him only. We're pulled. I would say, Pastor, she spoke this morning. God spoke to me. Would you pray for me? I need that. I need to make that commitment again. Who else? Amen. Who else? It's time to quit playing church and quit playing Christian time to say, Lord, only you, only you, and this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God. And if you're here this morning, you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. My friend, in just a moment, we'll stand to our feet. And I'd love for you to make your way to the front so we'd open a Bible and show you from the Word of God truth that God loves you and Jesus died for you. Lord, 
I ask for your help on this invitation. Lord, may we respond the way you've touched us. May we be moved this morning. Lord, if there are those here who need to do business with you, Lord, whether as a Christian or unsaved, would they do everything they're supposed to today? In Jesus' name, amen.